It's my pleasure to welcome you here to this, the, the very first in this new series of lectures, public lectures, um, focusing on uh, global challenges facing society and also emphasizing the role that this university, the University of Edinburgh, plays in terms of research addressing uh, these challenges. The lectures actually also form part of a brand new um, series, interdisciplinary first course uh, lectures uh, aimed at our undergraduates, and that's undergraduates across the university, regardless what, what the, the subject they may, you may be studying, but also at students from schools, from our schools across um, Edinburgh. And uh, I'm particularly pleased to welcome those of you who have made the trouble from the schools to get here. Thank you very much. And I hope you get something out of the evening this evening. It's great to see such a, a good turnout uh, for this first lecture. And I hope you'll be interested equally in the other lectures in the series uh, up here from the website. Um, and I guess I should point out the highlight of the series, uh, the last one, which is going to be given by John Snow, as you see there, which will be our Enlightenment lecture uh, this year. And that's certainly one, I think, not to be missed. So the background to the series is the, the growing recognition, as I'm sure you're aware, across the world of the urgency of tackling a, rage, a range of issues that are difficult, complex, interconnected issues that affect human well-being in general. And these issues, of course, are well known to us all. They include food, um, energy, water, security, infectious diseases, and uh, developments in technology and medicine, climate. They go on and on, all of which I think will to some extent be touched upon this evening by our speaker. So now I'd like to introduce him. Um, that's Professor Paul von Gardingen, who, I'll tell him a little about you, Paul, um, graduated with his PhD from the University of Canterbury in New Zealand and first came here to Edinburgh as a postdoctoral research fellow in 1986. He then returned to New Zealand to work at there at the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries before uh, coming back to Edinburgh to take up a lectureship in 1991. And since then, he's established himself as an eminent expert in international development with a wide range of experience in developing countries around the world. And he's a member of the Scottish Government's International Development Advisory Group and also is a senior advisor to the UK Government Department for International Development uh, in London, in Whitehall. He currently holds the UNESCO Chair of International Development at the university and was recently appointed as Director of the Ecosystem Services for Poverty Alleviation Program, which is a major new research initiative supported by UK government uh, and, and hosted here at the University of Edinburgh. And this initiative will support collaborative research with developing countries in Africa and South Asia the Amazon region and China, and provide the world leading research which is required to help international development. So Paul, please give us your lecture on global challenges, the perfect storm. Thank you. Well, thank you, Steve, and I'd like to uh, add my welcome to everybody. It's actually great to have an event like this, which is bringing together all of Edinburgh's community, because the University of Edinburgh is very much part of this community, and it's great to have the opportunity to share something about what we are doing here in terms of both our research and our education, and how that comes together to contribute to addressing some of these very large challenges which are facing society today. And I want to pick up on a couple of things which uh, Steve said in his introduction. It is about what are these global challenges and what can we do about it? Each one of us has something that we can do and today it's about raising a little bit of awareness about what some of these challenges are, what's been done and more importantly what needs to be done. So. The title of this lecture theatre, of this lecture series, is Our Changing World. 
But I want to start off today by considering what are our global challenges and come back to this, this title of the perfect storm which we started to hear about last year and I'll explain a little bit about it. Um, the perfect storm was introduced by the government's chief scientific advisor, um, Professor Sir John Beddington. The chief scientists exist within UK government to give the cutting edge scientific advice which will inform policy and action over um, the coming years. And last year, John Bennington said, actually, we've got to start thinking on a longer time horizon, um, thinking about what is going to happen to the world as a series of challenges um, influence our behaviour. And he coined this phrase, the perfect storm, and mentioned that there are a whole range of major global challenges which are coming together. Some of the ones which were mentioned were things such as the rapid rate of urbanisation. Um, we're now in a world which is radically different from the past, where over half of the population lives in cities. Poverty. We're in a world where a very large proportion of, the, of society is living in abject, absolute poverty. Energy where in many cases um, energy is limiting people's lives and where are we going to get the energy for our future needs. Water. We know that water is already limiting. Many parts of the world we see the effects of this in terms of droughts. We also see the exact opposite, floods, as we saw in Pakistan in recent months or in recent weeks. Food security. For anybody who's been buying food recently, it's gone up. It's actually some commodities have gone up over 50% in the last two years. And every prediction is that food security will become more and more an issue in the future. Biodiversity. Biodiversity this year is important. 2010 was the target that the Convention of Biodiversity gave the world to reverse the loss of biodiversity. Why? Because biodiversity is fundamental to life. It's behind agriculture, it's behind the forests which provide clean air between the water. Biodiversity is a fundamental building block for life. And unfortunately, this year, the Convention of Biological Diversity had to say, well, we didn't do it. We're still getting rapid loss of biodiversity, more rapid than we have had in recent history. Climate change. Last year there was a lot of discussion about climate change leading up to the Copenhagen um, Conference of Parties. And again, whilst there was a lot of discussion about um, the impacts of climate change and some discussion about what we need to do about it, we didn't really come out um, with a strong pathway forward. And then finally, going around the edge, we have infectious diseases. Um, the obvious ones which we have heard recently are things like SARS, bird flu, but there's actually a range of emerging infectious diseases um, which have the potential to have quite severe impacts on people's lives. And at the heart of this, I've also put one of the fundamental drivers for this, which is population and demographic change. In the developed world, in Europe, demography is one of the major challenges. As population ages, where is the productive part of the economy? Who is going to look after the older people as they, go, as they become older and live longer? Whereas in the developing world, um, there is a projected um, major increase of population, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. At present, the prediction is that over the next 40 years, so up to 2050, population will increase by a third of 3 billion people on Earth. Another 50% needing to be fed, 
to have clean water, to have education, to have energy, to have food. Is that possible? So the question behind the perfect storm is, if all of these things are projected to come together sometime over the next 20 to 40 years, how does global society adapt? What needs to be done? What does the future look like? And the idea behind this is to say, OK, look, there's a whole range of issues that we need to start addressing. But what do we need to do? So if we do it together, we think by 2030, these global challenges are likely to come together to bring this perfect storm. And the important thing there is to recognise that all of these challenges will come together at about the same time. And the resulting, um, or the result of that is that there are going to be a set of challenges beyond anything that society has needed to, to cope with before. So we really need to be thinking about different ways of working. Now, when you start thinking about that, you get rather negative. Actually, when I talk to some of my students, the natural response to hearing that, particularly in the evening, is let's go down to the pub and ignore it. But I don't want to leave you with a negative message. I actually want to give you a positive message. We can do something. We can actually have a more positive outcome. The worst of this perfect storm can be, ignored, can be avoided, but we need to do a few things differently. And that is part of the reason why this lecture is today. It's about what can we do differently, and also what do the world's major universities like Edinburgh need to do to contribute to that process. So, this is some of the first take-home messages. Yes, we need to start addressing each of the global challenges, but at the same time, oops, we need to recognise that these challenges are interconnected. It's no longer adequate just to look at climate change and not to think about energy. It's no longer adequate to look at water and not think about agriculture. We actually have to start looking, about, we're looking at these in an interconnected way, thinking about how climate change policy interacts with energy policy. And then the third point here is really important. For far too long, we've treated people as the problem. That's not going to work. What we actually have to say is, yeah, people are at the heart of the problem, but they are also going to be part of the solution. As we look forward over the next 20, 30 years, we've got to ask, what can people do? What can you do? What can the Edinburgh community do to avoid the worst of this perfect storm? So when we think about um, this, what's the important thing? Well, actually, we've got to stop just looking at each of these boxes and start thinking about how do they connect. And one of the important things here is to recognise that population is an important part of this. For quite some time, we've actually ignored this issue. But when you look at factors like climate change, food security, actually one of the things which is driving these major challenges is the changes in global population and um, also demographic change. And one of the failings in the last decades has been, this has actually been the elephant in the room, the one thing that we all know is there and the one thing we don't talk about. Well, that's got to stop because Population increases and demographic change are central to the global challenges. So if you look at the slide now, I've dropped out the little bit in the middle. And I'd say if you try to address any of those components around the edge without thinking about what are the drivers, it's not going to be necessarily the best way to avoid the perfect storm. So the first take-home message is if we're serious about addressing this, avoiding the worst of what might happen, we need to look at the system and all of the components. And just to link with my previous point, people are at the heart of this. They are at the heart of the issues underlying it, underlying the perfect storm, underlying the global challenges. But much more importantly, people 
will be underlying the solutions. And that's why it's really great to have this new undergraduate course, which is bringing in our enthusiastic young students to think, OK, at the start of my academic career, what can we be doing? The same for the children, well, from the young people coming from schools. There are things that you can do, and you know, this is part of that journey. So people are at the heart of both the underlying causes and the challenges. And then the role of institutions like Edinburgh is that research and science can provide these two things, knowledge and evidence, to inform and select our common future. Because we can make choices. And one of the important things that re research universities like Edinburgh needs to do is to provide the knowledge, the evidence, and the skilled individuals that can help this process. And because it's the evening, I don't want to have lots of facts. I just want to actually illustrate um, partly how our thinking has changed in terms of the way that we address global challenges, but also um, how we can use science to start to address it. And the way that I'm going to do this is just to illustrate it with how my own research career has changed over the period. As, as Steve said, when I started off um, in New Zealand, I was working on the native forests there. I now work in tropical forests uh, in Africa, in um, Latin America, as well as many other ecosystems. But the important thing when I was reflecting on this is that the way that we do science has changed over that period. And it's quite interesting to see this because that also is a um, way of informing our future action. And when I was preparing this lecture, I suddenly realised actually there's really been three phases in terms of the types of research, the types of activities that I've done. The first phase I've called the technical phase. And that was sort of up to the year 2000. And the idea there was, let's find the technical solution, because we can fix everything with science. We just have to find the technology. And this was a, probably a common approach for a lot of the ways that we were trying, or the global research community was trying to deal with those challenges over that time. We'd pick a single problem and throw technology at it. So, this was actually my, my PhD there in New Zealand. I was tasked with trying to understand um, what factors controlled the regeneration, the regrowth of native forests in the country. So in terms of the work that I did there, I went into the, into the forest. I measured lots of things. I clamped nice bits of expensive equipment onto the leaf and measured how much um, oxygen was being given off, how much carbon dioxide was going in. And the idea was to collect all of this technological information. And as soon as we knew that, as soon as I understood how the plant interacted with the environment, I would understand what was going on in the forest. And to some degree, we did. Then I came to Scotland for the first time. And by this time, I was actually really interested in, in many environmental issues. So I ended up here looking at wind damage and other damages to grasses. I went really, really into the fine detail. For those of you who don't know, these are stomata from the leaf of a plant. You could just get a human hair going through that little pore on the leaf surface. And the idea of behind this work is trying to understand what was happening in terms of controlling these openings in the leaves. And the idea was if we had understood that again, we would understand more about how plants interact with their environment and also start to um, understand how better to manage our natural environment. And again, it was interesting, it was a lot of fun. Um, but by this time, I was beginning to get a little bit frustrated, thinking, OK, if I'm really looking down and just seeing these wee holes on a leaf surface, what's the relevance of that to some of the bigger environmental issues, which at the same time were, be, were starting to be discussed by society. So in 92, 
Um, we had the Earth Summit in Rio, the UN Conference on Environment and Development, which gave us Agenda 21. It also gave us a lot of the large UN agencies dealing with environmental issues, such as the Convention of Biodiversity, the Climate Change Convention, or the Framework Convention on Climate Change, targets to protect land. But what was really important here was in terms of the way that society was thinking. We moved from a little bit about the technological fix to start thinking, OK, what are some of these major environmental challenges? Things at that time which were important included ozone depletion, loss of, de of the forests, loss of biodiversity. But what came out of that was, a, again, a strong agenda, which is we need to fix the environment. We need to stop biodiversity loss. We need to stop deforestation. Agenda 21 gave us um, targets which were very much about fixing the environment. And what was interesting is that that affected our research. So the next set of research that I started on was looking at how these environmental challenges were working out in the environment. The next example is probably the, my most fun day in research. This is a small site in Italy. And we went there to understand how rising CO2 emissions impacted on plants. Now, you're not even going to guess what this is. And yeah, Mickey Mouse did come. It was the only balloons we could get. Every night, this is a hollow, and it fills up with carbon dioxide because there's a mineral springs, and the CO2 bubbles up. And that's why these plants have been living in this environment for centuries at high CO2 concentrations. And we went there to see what does long-term CO2 um, exposure do to plants. Because everywhere else, um, we just don't have that information. We want to know what are the long-term effects of environmental change. And this is one of the few places in the world that you can do it. The balloons, well, actually what happens is in the morning, this you can actually go there, it's shimmering, and it's almost pure CO2, a little lake there. And we tried and we tried to take photos, and we couldn't. So what we did is we actually filled these balloons up just with our breath, and you can float it on top of this little sea of CO2. Um, that's one photo. There's also a lovely photo of a friend of mine going into this area wearing full diving gear because uh, there's no, no oxygen down there, so you don't survive very long. But what came out of that was an understanding of how the environment or environmental change interacts um, with the vegetation, with the plants. Um, very interesting story there. The, the local farmers realised that plants grew much quicker. And they thought, oh, this is a bit magical. Now, their understanding of biology wasn't really that good because plants grow quicker in high CO2. Unfortunately, when they put chickens at the bottom of this, they didn't. <laughs> this is why you need to know a little bit of basic biology. OK, at the same, well, about the same time, um, we had an exchange between Edinburgh University and um, King Abdulaziz University in Saudi Arabia. And what they were interested in was getting some collaboration going, looking at how some of the major environmental challenges were feeding into their agricultural systems. Now, what I didn't realise at the time, at that particular time, Saudi Arabia was in the top 10 wheat-producing nations of the world. You go, whoa. And that's on the left. That is a centre pivot irrigation system which was producing wheat in Saudi Arabia something you don't really think about. On the right is a more traditional system, which is around um, a small water source, and these are the, the date palms. It's very green because this was a week after the annual rain. Two weeks later, it was dry. But it's actually the one left which is really important because you can grow wheat in the desert. But in order to do that, they're putting wells down almost two kilometres deep and taking up water, 
which has been there for thousands of years. And more importantly, year on year, the water levels are dropping. So is that agricultural system sustainable? No. And this is where we're suddenly starting to think, okay, many of the activities which seem sensible at the time because they were self-sufficient with food, they could actually uh, export it, is this going to be an, the right way forward um, for the human race? And in terms of contrasting that, what happens if we get it wrong? What happens if we don't have enough water or if agriculture goes wrong? So here's another landscape that I was working on at the same time, which is in the south of Spain, just outside the, uh, the city of Almeria. And this is a degraded landscape. It used to be much more productive, but they over-farmed it, they overgrazed it, and now that landscape, that vegetation, is beyond repair. It is degraded, it's non-productive. Um, you have some very, very resilient bushes and grasses, but the ability to support human life on there, to provide food, is much reduced. And the reason for that is we have gone beyond the limit. And that's a sobering thought, is that if we go beyond the limit, we can't undo it sometimes. And that's why we need to start thinking about how these challenges come together. So, the next big policy issue which came up came around the year 2000. In the year 2000, we all were reflecting about where we'd come from and what was coming next. And an important part of that was the United Nations called um, their Millennium Summit. And it was the time when most of the world's leaders descended on New York at this time of year. And they produced a thing called the Millennium Declaration, um, which said, actually, we need to start thinking about people. We need to start thinking about the future of society on Earth. And a year later, they set what's called the Millennium Development Goals, which have really focused um, a lot of the global development activities over the last decade. Here they are. I'm not going to go into them in great details, but the main things are it's about people. It's about eradicating poverty, universal primary education, gender equality. There are three goals on health. There's one on environmental sustainability, and there's another one on a partnership for global development. But there's one important common theme going through all of this. And that has been when we're talking about these global challenges and the future of development from 2000, this phrase, people matter. And if you think about what I was talking about previously about our research, up to about um, the first phase, up to about 92 when the Rio summit came, it was all about technology. Then we started thinking about the way that these challenges interact. From 2000 onwards, we've been thinking much more about the role of people in the system and um, how that works. So let's go illustrate this with a couple more recent bits of work. Is I've spent, we had a large program looking at, at forest management in Indonesia. It actually spanned this, this 2000 um, change. We went in there trying to understand the forest, but by the time we, we left, we actually realised that the important thing was to understand the role of people in the forest, understanding the role of communities, policy and governance, the way that we all interact. Um, the pictures here are actually the first time that I was exposed to this in my research career. It's when I sort of turned from being a natural scientist to being a social scientist. We were going up in the, in the heart of, of Borneo in Indonesia to a, a village which was one of the local indigenous tribes. And what was different then was that we went into this community and asked people, what actually matters to you? How are you interacting with the forest? What do you need? And 
this is the phase that I'm talking about, is that we've had a lot of focus over the last 10 years about people matter and their role in the system. In this particular one, it was um, reasonably positive. This was a successful community. I said, you know, what do you think of, the, of, your, of your forest? And they said, no, it's not our forest. We're relative, we're, you know, we're, we're incomers. We've only come here recently. So I said, but this house looks quite old. How long have you been here? They said, oh, 150 years. Um, quite a different perspective. So that was, that was actually a community which was living pretty much in balance with their natural environment. Whereas in Kenya, um, I've had two PhD students looking at drivers of change in pastoralism. So this is the Maasai, both in um, um, Kenya and Tanzania. And their, their lifestyles are having to change quite radically, partly because of population pressure, people moving to cities, other uses coming up for land. But what is absolutely certain is in that particular part of East Africa, the future will look radically different for them. And that's not just because of the droughts. It's also because of um, changing land use, farming coming in, the game parks, etc. And my, my PhD student has just finished. He is actually a village leader. And he's saying that the future for his people will be radically different. Um, there's no going back. So in terms of his life, these global challenges are now. The challenges of food, the challenges of water, um, and poverty. So coming back to the perfect storm, that's 2009, last year when, when this came out. And it was a point which saying, OK, look, we've got to stop just looking at each component and start to look at them um, in to together. So looking from now and looking forward, there's a couple points. Number one is population matters. We can't ignore this issue any longer. OK? Current models say by 2050, I would say there is going to be at least 9 billion on Earth. There could be more. It could be less. But at present, I would say it's going to be 9 billion or more on current trends. Also, we've got to bring those two phases together. People matter, but so does the environment. We can't look at these things in isolation. And through that, we're starting to look at new ways of, of working and research about integrating people and the environment, people and ecology. And then the next point is that we can address these, these challenges if we work together, if we break down the boundaries which, which separate biologists from social scientists, from medics. We need to work together. We need to work across political boundaries. And we need to work in new ways. I just want to take each of these very briefly before I stop. Population matters. And as I said, we've got to stop ignoring this and say, well, what can be done? It doesn't require draconian measures. The first thing which I would say is that we can actually do quite a bit by giving people the rights which are already there in terms of international agreements. The first one is um, giving women the right to control their own fertility and to make choices about that. In order to do that, its access to education is important and also modern methods of contraception. When we look at the countries on Earth which have the highest population growth rates, they are also, well, they tend also to be the countries which have got the highest proportion of women who say they want to control their, their fertility but don't have the ability to do it for whatever reason, whether it be access to contraception or um, not, being a, not being allowed to make their own choices. We also need better ways of predicting the future. Um, our current predictions are based on an assumption that by the end of the century, 
all countries on Earth will be at replacement level. I ask the question, what if our predictions are wrong? And because of that, we need to think about population in all parts of what we're doing. So in terms of moving forward, we've got to stop just looking at single issues and look much more at integrating what's going on. So John Beddington last year gave us this perfect storm. That goes part of the way, but it still leaves us looking at single issues. So what we've been doing, or my group's been doing, is looking at, well, can we re-engineer the way that we look at this so it becomes more integrated? We need to develop a more integrated analysis which put people at the heart of development. And that's what this image here is designed to do, is to say when we are talking about the way of addressing these global challenges, the way of avoiding the perfect storm, we need to recognise that things are connected. That you can't be talking about addressing climate change, climate security, without also be thinking about population, demography, the scarcity of resources, like water, like food, trade, economics. All of these features interact. So if we're serious about addressing um, climate change, if we're serious about addressing environmental degradation, we need to be looking in a more holistic way. And that brings me to the last point, which is you know, some of the things that Edinburgh University is involved in. At present, we're actually doing a lot about linking our research into some of these major global challenges. At the moment, the university is involved in setting up a major new initiative, which is the Edinburgh Climate Change Centre, about making our knowledge available to influence policy and practice to help educate the next generation of policy makers, opinion formers, experts who will do that. As Steve mentioned also, in the last few weeks, we've taken on the role of leading, or at least providing academic leadership, for a new UK initiative looking at how ecosystems, the natural systems around us, can be used for good to reduce poverty. And what we're trying to do, this, do here is to adopt new ways of working to build up partnerships that ensures that the world's poorest people actually benefit from the ecosystems around them. Looking at working in new ways, these integrative approaches, linking disciplines and also linking regions. Um, and this project or the programme is really quite exciting in that it's the f one of the first UK research programmes which is truly global. It's working in Africa, South Asia, China and in um, South America. It's asking in all of these regions what can science do to improve people's lives by looking at the way that they interact um, with their ecosystems. And just to give you an idea of how global this is, this is a, an image which I captured last night. It's already out of date. The pro well, our part of the program is really just starting, and at the moment we're getting people around the world to register their interest um, in working on this major global challenge of how do you link ecosystems and the reduction of poverty. We've got about 200 researchers at the moment, and uh, probably will have double that by next week. What's important about that is it actually illustrates much of what I've been talking about today. It's about looking at the role of people in the world, about addressing these global challenges, about building up international partnerships to address them, and also adopting um, new ways of working. So just to finish and to leave time for some questions, what can we do? How can we avoid my starting point? 
which is the perfect storm. How can we avoid the perfect storm? Or more realistically, how can we avoid the worst of the perfect storm? The first point is we need to act now. We need to generate the science. We need to engage in the difficult discussions. We need to be linking with policymakers. Because if we don't, I would say that the default action is we will actually drift towards the worst of that perfect storm. The food scarcities, the conflict over water. But we can avoid it, and I'd suggest we must. The second point is population matters. And it needs to be talked about. We need to th think about it. We need to think about the impacts on the environment, on resources, and to recognise that we can do something about it. But it doesn't need to be draconian. As I said, education and giving people choice will go most of the way that we, that we might need to go. Third point, research and science needs to adopt new ways of working that is going outside our traditional disciplines. Not, so I started off as a plant scientist um, in a very narrow field. I now work partly in environmental science, which is plants, animals, water, but also in the social sciences, understanding how society works, understanding how information is used, how policies are made. We need to adopt new ways of working which links these disciplines, which links researchers around the world, and more importantly, we've got to recognise that science has an important role, and that is to generate the skills, the knowledge, and most important, the evidence which is going to be required for society to meet these challenges. And then my final point, and probably the most important one, is people in society may be the source of many of the problems. But we've got to stop beating ourselves up and look at it much more positively than that. Is that people, all of us in this room, need to be part of the solutions. And thinking of the, uh, the students who are just joining Edinburgh, you know, that can be your call, of, call to action. You've got the next four years here, and then some of you will go on and do postgraduate courses. Use that opportunity to think about these major challenges and how you can pick up skills, knowledge, information, networks that you can contribute to be part of that solution. And think about that during the, the, the next few lectures because there are links to many of those for things which I've been talking about today. We can all be part of the solutions to global challenges. We can all play our part to help avoid the worst of the perfect storm. But we need to start working differently and we need to start doing it now. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Paul. Is there a microphone? Uh, there's just want to say thank you very much indeed for that wonderful start to the series. Um, Paul's very kindly agreed to take questions. Um, I don't know if anyone would like to start off. Someone right up in the corner there, we'll please. Need get, we'll need to get the mics up. Yeah, there I tell you well. what. Um, <laughs> we need we need that. Wait. Yep. Sorry, who was it? Right in the corner. Um, you talked a lot about the importance to look at uh, demography, um, which I agree is definitely an issue, but what also, like, what would you think about the consumption patterns that we have in the more economically developed co countries? So, for instance, one Brit is responsible for 20 times as much CO2 as one Bangladeshi, and we're not saying that we should all have the life of a Bangladeshi, but are we consuming too much? And moreover... Isn't it our economic and political priorities and values that are responsible for many of the factors that you were talking about 
in the perfect storm. <laughs> um, yeah, it is. But um, the, the phrase that we tend to use here is equity. And it's, it's not just about pulling one group up or pushing one group down. It's about everybody needs to recognise that the future is going to be radically different and we all need to change. Um, so, uh, yes, there are issues about um, consumption patterns, but at the end of this, I think we've also got to be realistic, is that at the end of the next 20 years, the world is not going to be entirely homogeneous. So the, the issues are going to be compromises. But um, when we look, for example, at climate change, some of the most radical changes which need to happen is within many of the developed worlds, using less resources, using resources um, more efficiently, whilst also helping the emerging economies to um, not repeat our own mistakes. So to look for development trajectories which are low carbon at the same time that we do. There's a paradox between um, the need to uh, sustain biodiversity and the need to uh, improve agricultural production. Could you comment upon this uh, paradox? Um, it, go it goes beyond that. And um, it's interesting that you use the word sustain as opposed to conserve. Uh, because this has been one of, the, one of the big challenges, is that it's absolutely important, for example, to sustain the level of biodiversity, because that is going to be um, fundamental in terms of, of future survival of the Earth and of, this, of the species on Earth. Um, we need that biodiversity there. However... Um, we can't conserve the past. The future will look different. The ecosystems will look different. That's unavoidable. So it's getting this balance between maintaining um, a level of biodiversity whilst accepting that the future will be radically different from the past. Basically, there are too many people on Earth. There has been too much change already for the future to look identical to the recent past. And that's not really what people want to hear, but it is the reality. We can't conserve the past because we're already rapidly moving into the future. But we need biodiversity or else we won't have much of a future. Um, would I be correct in suggesting that <clears throat> when your mother was about the age of some of the undergraduates who are here, that there were about 2,000 million on the planet. And that in the intervening 60 or so years, we have reached 7,000 million. And in the process have <coughs> removed a lot of the biodiversity and indeed much of the fish in the sea and other things and how would you like to give us a guide to knowing how this can be reversed in the next 20 years? Well, there, there's, there's two questions there. Because um, the question that I'd ask is, is reversing what? In terms of reversing the, the, the trend for loss of biodiversity, um, we can do quite a bit by changing, um, by changing behaviour, by, for example, stopping some of the damaging um, activities. So where we know that the fishery resource is being overexploited and that's damaging biodiversity, where we know overexploitation of the forests is damaging it, we need to stop that. We need to find alternatives. In terms of regaining what's already been lost, it's not really going to be very practical over the, over the timescales that we're looking at it. We can, we can stop the, the, well, we can reverse the decline or reduce the rate of decline um, 
but realistically speaking, that's probably as far as we can go. Um, we, what we can't afford to do is to continue doing what we've been doing for the last 60 years, or 40 years, whichever. Hi, thank you. Uh, your, your analysis seems eminently sensible, um, and it's based on, on the, the fact that um, there is both repression of, um, of, of, of people and their actions and exploitation of the system. So wouldn't, surely your advice ought to be to the young students involved, the young scientists involved, rather than go and learn the science, be go out, organise and agitate? <laughs> Um, there's, there's, a, there's, a, no, there's a role for everything. Um, and you know, again, in terms of a lot of the work that we do, you need to have a, a good relationship between generating the evidence because you can only have um, useful debate if there is evidence. But you also need to be linking in with the civil society groups, which sometimes is, are agitating, sometimes it is actually just about informing. What we have to stop doing is saying that science is at the top of this ivory tower and is better than everybody. It's not. Science is part of the society around it, and I strongly believe that science is there to serve, to serve society, not to dictate to it. So, working together. fits in perfectly with what I was wondering, Paul, which um, on the kind of front of informing the agitating and the organising, uh, where do you see, uh, you talked about the kind of project that humanity needs to undertake. How do you imagine uh, we're going to organise this as a, as a society? Do you maintain faith in the uh, United Nations organisations that you've been involved with over many years? Uh, we know last winter we had the, the Copenhagen conference. In two years, there's the uh, Rio Plus 20 conference. On the flip side of that, there's people organizing things at the university and in, in town, mm -hmm. things like the Transition at every University Initiative. Where do you put your, your faith in, Paul? Is it how, how are, who's going to solve this problem and, and which functions? Is it, is it going to be internationalization, international solutions, or is it going to be local stuff? Is there, are many, there are many parts to that question. Let, let's address the UN. The UN is um, not the organisation that would be designed today if, it, if we were starting from scratch. However, it does still have very useful functions. And I believe that, well, from my own perspective, I think that it's better to work with what we've got rather than to dream about something that we might have had. The UN and various other multilateral organisations have got a lot, uh, have got an important role to play. But there is a gap, and that is, I think, yeah, within you know this atmosphere of being inside the University of Edinburgh, being with the informed, unfortunate minority of society. One of the really important things that we need to generate is demand from the majority of society. If you really want to see evidence of this, just go and look at the quality of programmes that we have on TV, the quality of discussion that we have in the print media. I don't see society asking for action. And what is really important is if people are the solution, people actually need to start wanting that solution. And we need much more groundswell about people saying, yes, we all want to have something different. We all want to avoid the perfect storm. But at present, it's much more about um, the media, celebs, and who's doing what. So how about having some informed debate amongst the rest of society? not just us. Um, I think we'll take one more question. I'm sorry, but um, otherwise we're going to go on and really push on forever. It could. I, I agree completely with your last point. I'd also just like to pick up on the first points raised in the corner up there, with, with which I completely agree. I would argue that um, one of the... Well, I cringe whenever I hear politicians talking about the need for 
more growth. We measure growth in GDP largely, which actually doesn't correlate in developed countries with anything worthwhile. In fact, the only thing it correlates with one above a certain level is in fact consumption of non-renewable resources. Um, so I think we need to call for a new measure of economic performance. Uh, President Sarkozy asked uh, Joseph Stieglitz and uh, Marcia Sen and a, and a French economist to come up with such a, a proposal and I believe they're looking at implementing that. Um, I would just like to also refer people to um, the Equality Trust website which brings together work from uh, R Richard Wilkinson, uh, Kate Pickett and others on the devastating effects of inequality and I think that needs to be uh, central to any new society. Thank you. Um, I'd probably say yes, yes, and yes. Um, equality, you know, addressing equality, or actually, ad more importantly, addressing the inequalities around us is really important. Um, this issue about, well, the two issues about growth. Um, do people in the developed world, the, the privileged few on earth, do we really need to have this rapid growth in our countries? Probably not. However, for people who are living at the bottom of the global heap, who are having to survive on below the absolute poverty line, which is set at a dollar and 25 cents a day, they could do with some economic growth because that, you've got no idea just what it is like to survive under those conditions. So this is about equality, is saying, well, actually, maybe I don't need economic growth, but there are people on Earth who do. And your final point, referring back to the Sarkozy Commission, totally right. For the last decade, we have had a measure of development which has been purely on GDP. There is more to human well-being than just GDP, and we need to be looking at alternatives. And um, again, for the people starting off your professional career, going through Edinburgh, um, this is an area that you guys should be debating. Just like there can be a different way for development, there needs to be a different way of measuring it. And I think that's a good place to stop. Thank you very much, Paul. Yeah, um, I, I, I think the discussion we're having here, which I'm really sorry to have to curtail, really reflects the, the importance, obviously, of, of the topic that, that we, we've chosen for the first lecture and the way in which uh, it was delivered, uh, in spite of the uh, <laughs> technological glitch, um, I think was superb. And your interaction and enthusiasm, it's obvious by the number of hands going up, it, it is, is really a, a, a massive endorsement for the series. Please come back for the next one in the series, which is next Tuesday at the same time. And hopefully as we go through the series, the picture will start to emerge in a slightly perhaps a more positive, perhaps a more negative way. But one thing I would just urge you to consider, and Paul, I hope you would agree that this is a reasonable thing, that we are all part of a community, most of us, and those of you who are not are very much welcome to join us for these sorts of discussions, ongoing discussions. It doesn't end here. And the lecture, this lecture and the other lectures will be going up on the web. And by way of uh, feedback, I'm sure um, colleagues here, not least of all Paul, would be very welcome to receive any feedback. And if it's appropriate to convene anything by way of uh, uh, subsequent downstream seminars that, that feed off of these, these um, topics, then so much the better. It's entirely consistent with the spirit and purpose of these, of these lectures. So uh, thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. And thank you very much, audience, for your... Uh, attendance and participation. This production is copyright, the University of Edinburgh.